I'm not clapping for myself. So yeah, hi, welcome to such a big crowd and, and I want to thank everyone for coming here before we get started. So today's subject is going to be about a rather complicated concept proposed by Jacques Derrida and of course Bo is sitting somewhere, leaning, <laughs> leaning right there. He'd know plenty about Derrida. So basically, just a few notes on my personal work outside of university before we get started, just to kind of like set the frame for this talk or the purpose of this talk. So on some of my, so I make video essays on YouTube outside of university and I try to apply philosophy direct or, directly to our lives and I sort of try to um, tease out some of the great academic theories by some of our favorite theorists and try to apply them under a frame of how do we actually use philosophy, literature, and history to change our lives practically. Not just some you know, intellectual exercise. We can spend hours debating a line about Plato or some, some line from Aristotle for hours on end. But at the end of the day, we have to return philosophy back. Oh, hello. We have to return philosophy back to its original purpose, which is the love of wisdom. And the love of wisdom directly pertains to how do we use philosophy to live our lives. So in a sense, I just want to open up today's talk by firstly addressing that. I hope you guys are aware that this generation right here, we're dealing with some brand new problems. We're dealing with a lot of problems that previous generations, you know, they've never had to worry about. For example, today's subject um, is going to be on social media or how exactly do we process information effectively using uh, the tools of philosophy, using tools inherent within the philosophical discourse. And especially today, we're going to use some of the theories within postmodernism modernism or post-structuralism to address this constant influx of information. So right now, we're living in the age of information overload. When you open up your phone first thing in the morning, it's going to blow up with like 20,000 notifications. And it's really difficult to dis distinguish falsehood from truth or nonsense from principles. So hopefully after today's talk, we can sort of view Derrida in a new light. So it's not just this complicated philosopher that's just um, that's confusing, confusing the hell out of, out of everyone. But we can actually use some of the concepts of Derrida to actually um, filter through information more effectively. So the story all started. In order to understand Derrida, we have to rewind the clock all the way back to the great ancient Greek philosophers. And then there's a joke. It's not even a joke. I think it's a fact at this point that every philosophical theory is just a footnote to Plato. So in order to understand Derrida, um, if we try to understand Derrida before we talk about Plato, it's like trying to understand dubstep without understanding classical music. So Plato wrote this dialogue called Phaedrus. And Phaedrus is, in a sense, just Plato's rendition of, his, um, of conversations between Socrates and these wonderful characters. And there's, of course, academic debates about, you know, did Socrates actually exist? Of course he did exist, but did these dialogues actually happen? You know, that's up for, up for debate for the purpose of this talk. During one of the conversations, Plato wrote this character called Phaedrus, and he had a conversation with Socrates. And Socrates was, in a sense, debating this topic of speech overriding with this Athenian aristocrat, Phaedrus. So Socrates, in his good old fashion, went up to Phaedrus. And then, because he's Socrates, he typically poses a question and answers, and, uh, answers the question himself. So he posed a question to Phaedrus. Do you think speech is better than writing? Or do you think writing is better than speech? And of course, Socrates, Socrates ate up his own question. And he answered it by telling a story about um, King Thamus and Theoth. So if you know anything about Egyptian myth, which is um, Theoth is in a sense the god of writing, the god of symbols, and the god of arithmetic, and the god of, well, of course, writing. So one day Theoth went up to King Thamus, and he said to King Thamus, I got this amazing gift for you. So here's the gift of writing for you. So we can use this gift of writing to transform how Egyptians think. We can dis disseminate concepts better. We can tell people, we can, you know, encourage people to do arithmetic, to keep track of the crops, to keep track of things that people are growing. We can keep track of everything through using writing, and we don't have to remember anything now. Right? So we, we have this tool of writing, which I'm going to give to you as the god of writing. But then King Thamus, he sat there, scratched his beard, thought about it a little bit. He said, no, I don't want this gift of writing. And Theoth, Theoth was rather offended. He was like, why don't you want this gift of writing? It's so wonderful. You can use it to make people smarter. But King Thamus simply said, by using the tool of writing, you're actually, in a sense, making people dumber because they no longer have to rely on their memories. They no longer have to reason on their feet. They no longer have to utilize um, their wit, so to speak, on the spot. They no longer have to utilize their rationality. All they have uh, are these pieces of paper. They can just write things down without worrying about them. Right? 
So it wasn't just Plato. This paranoia, or should I say this, um, this dislike, or rather paranoia for writing, essentially haunted uh, the Western philosophical tradition for thousands of years. So dating back from Plato and eventually to Aristotle, and Aristotle went as far as, far as to coin writing as something that's defective or a mere supplement to speech. And then when we uh, venture into the Enlightenment philosophy period, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the famous Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, even coined writing as a dangerous supplement. So it is um, poison, so to speak, that poisons people's minds. So writing is this dangerous thing that if you put it out there, it could potentially cause a lot of troubles. So the key problem with writing, so um, there was a brilliant book by Peter Salmon, which is an introduction to Jacques Derrida. The book's title is um, An Event, perhaps. So in the book, according to Peter Salmon, writing without speech or writing without the presence of the speaker cannot defend itself. So for example, if I write my sister a shopping list and I just leave it on the table, this piece of writing is open to all forms of misinterpretations. It's open to all forms of misreadings. For example, I want three apples. I didn't specify how many apples. I mean, I did specify that, but I didn't specify what color the apples were or uh, what kind of apple I'm, I'm looking for or what you know, the quantities, the size of the apples. So it's easier if I just call her on the phone and tell her, hey, I want three blah, blah, blah apples, and then specify it, or even better, I should go to the store with her to specify the apples that I want. But if I simply leave her a list, this piece of writing simply cannot defend itself. It's open to all sorts of interpretations. So this, in a sense, formed um, this paranoia for writing, this paranoia that writing could simply escape from you. It cannot defend itself with a father. It cannot defend itself you know, because there's no guaranteed presence. It's a pure absence, so to speak. It's a play of symbols. And once you have the symbols, you can do whatever you want with it, then that opens up the Pandora's box for misinterpretations. So it could seem like, it, it probably seemed like I just went on a philosophical rant. So what is on this philosophy stuff from Plato to Aristotle to you know, writing and my sister going to the grocery store? What does that have to do with social media? So I want you to realize very distinctly that the primary form on social media right now, and we've all, we've, we all know the debate of like how writing's in, in decline, no one ever reads anymore, and people can't even sit through a 4,000 word blog post anymore. So there's always the, this debate around how people are reading less and less, and a dominant medium that we're relying on right now is through actually through speech. So even if you read a blog post on the internet, I, I, I want you to realize that you're actually engaging with an act of speech because some of the most popular blog posts, the writer assumes a conversational tone to get the meaning across more rapidly. So on YouTube, that's just a blatant example. I'm speaking as a person right now for people who are watching this video. Speech is the primary uh, medium. And on Instagram, if you watch a reel, people are speaking to you. On TikTok, people are speaking to you, right? So the primary dominant form that we're relying on is primarily through speech. And when I was younger, if I need to find out some information about something. I have to drag my mom to the library. I have to tell her, hey, I really need this library card of yours. Please, can I check this book out? Can I find out information that way? So I had to go through a process of digging through the catalogs, reading everything, and I'm sort of finding everything out that way. So instead of, so right now, instead of trying to dig through information and sorting out the confusing component of writing, instead of dealing with that, you know, the exchange of symbols, the, comp the complexity of symbols, instead of engaging with that, field of uncertainties. Of course, reading is a, um, reading's very much you know, more difficult to engage. The form of reading is actually more difficult to do than just listening to something. And then instead of putting up with that, I can just search up a YouTube video on a thing that I want to know. I can just search up a blog post, a very simple blog post on, for example, how to bake a cake. For example, how to assemble, assemble this airsoft rifle that I want to play with. That, that was what I was into when I was a kid. But I also want you to realize that because the form of speaking, there's a presence of the speaker in a YouTube video. There's a presence of the speaker in an Instagram reel or a presence of an assumed speaker in a blog post. Then the gap of interpretation is a lot smaller. So when you're engaging with a social media medium, you're in a sense engaging with a guaranteed meaning on the spot. So your understanding is very much setting stone. You watch a lecture on YouTube about some complicated philosophical theory. You can get a direct interpretation right there. If you want to look up, for example, what is the definition of Cartesian philosophy, there's a definition right there on the first page of Google. You can click it and you're like, I think I understand it. But a problem there, it works for a cake. It works for how to break a, bake a cake or it works for how to assemble an airsoft rifle. But when it comes down to complex information, for example, 
uh, um, terminologies in philosophy. For example, how to interpret history. For example, various forms of knowledge that are actually very much difficult to digest. There's a danger for us to leap to a conclusion when we're engaging with these topics. There's a danger for us to simply leap on a web page and find the first definition and call it a day. And there's a danger for us to take um, the assumed understanding that we harvested, harvested from influencers on the internet and take that as truth. So in a sense, by reducing the gap that we have between us and the content that we're receiving from social media, that's actually compressing the space that we have for critical thinking. Whereas if we, um, if we check a book out, out of the library, if we struggle with the, the original text of these philosophers, if we struggle with Aristotle's ethics for a few weeks, then we're actually going through the process of critical thinking. But with the advent of social media, with the internet, with Google, with Wikipedia, that gap of interpretation and critical thinking is a lot smaller. So that's the problem that I'm simply pointing out. And now we're going to move on to, you know, how do we actually deal with this phenomen phenomenon of this reduction of space that we have to think critically? How do we deal with that? So in the summer of 1965, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida was on a steamboat with his family um, to Venice when a strange insight hit him. And, oh, hello when a strange insight hit him. And the strange insight, after he had this insight, he turned to his wife, Margaret, and said to her, I think something just happened to me. And something did indeed happen to Jacques Derrida at the very moment. And that little insight ballooned into probably one of the most bonkers book, one of the most bonkers books ever written called Of Grammatology. So among many discussions on um, Chinese alphabet phenomenology, and then various deconstructions of enlightenment thinking. Um, there's even a chapter about you know, masturbation in there, so if you can find that out. It's just a crazy book full of insights, full of contradictions, and full of um, impenetrable French prose. But among many of these discussions, the key dichotomy, one of the key, key dichotomies that Jacques Derrida was trying to deconstruct was this dichotomy between reading, uh, not right, not reading, this dichotomy between speech and writing. So why is it the case that there's this grand tradition in philosophy of being afraid of writing. Why is this you know, fear of confusion coming in? So as I talked about before, writing is a form that takes a lot more sort of digging to actually find inherent meaning. And some might even argue that there's no direct interpretation of the text. So you have to wrestle with the text uh, for a little longer if you want to really tease out the meaning out of it. So for Derrida, the solution to sort of, to, to deal with this kind of confusion is to, uh, is to introduce the concept of difference. So difference is a concept that's impossible to explain in a short talk like this. But in its essence, difference from its roots is a mode of deference, it's deferring meaning. It's, in a sense, putting off the definition of a thing till later. So you never have a concrete definition right off the bat. So you're, in a sense, reading that first article on, on Google, and you're, in a sense, looking at that, you're doubting it. You're like, I'm not going to trust my first instinct. I'm not going to leap to conclusions when I read this first article. I'm not, not going to leap to a, the subjective meaning, right? Because the internet is trying to anchor you down to some meaning whilst excluding all these possible interpretations of a certain thing. So through employing this concept of difference, we can open ourselves up to this idea of deferring our certain interpretation till later, deferring the sense of meaning that we want to draw out from this text till later. So we can, in a sense, uh, bask in a mode of confusion. And confusion here is a very important emotion because um, Derrida actually had a term for this, um, for this state of confusion called aporia. So aporia is a Greek term which indicates a kind of logical impasse when you're confused. When environment, when information in, in your environment, they don't make immediate sense, you're gonna submerge yourself in a state of, um, state of aporia. So aporia is something that we are really good at running away from. Certain situations in life when they don't make much sense, we want some direct meaning. We want some anchored meaning. We want to know um, the fact. Or if we don't have all the facts, we want to leap to some conclusion about, for example, if someone didn't text you back for three hours, you want to leap to a conclusion about, oh shit, this person must hate me, right? So that's the sort of inability to deal with that suspension, that state of uncertainty, which is um, in Derridian terms, it's called a state of difference. So if we can truly use this concept of difference and put off meaning till later and you know, suspend our beliefs and suspend our judgments till later, that's the space that we need to critically engage with con content or concepts on the internet. That's gonna open up the space for more critical thinking. And just one more note here. Um, 
I want you to imagine, just to ground everything down in a very beautiful metaphor, when you're trying to understand something, and when you try to anchor down a direct interpretation of something, it is like, as if you're a taxidermist and you're trying to pin down a butterfly. So the butterfly, in its natural form, has various movements and various beautiful you know, natural cycles, mating cycles. But if a taxidermist simply decides to pin down a butterfly, it is a perfectly still form. It's in a frame, it's very pretty, you can sell it. But what that's excluding, without employing this deference, what that's excluding is all of these variations, all, all of these beautiful manifestations of the bu butterfly in its natural surroundings. So in a sense, if we view knowledge in a very same way, if we try to pin down everything we ever learn without opening ourselves up to think critically or to defer our, our understanding to later, what we're sacrificing is perhaps the beauty of be com being confused, the beauty of knowledge, and the beauty of philosophical investigations. And just to end here, if we truly embrace confusion, we'd be immune to, to the effects of mindless information on the internet. And if we embrace this period of this aporia period, we can then truly figure out what is nonsense and what is, what is, a, what is nonsense and what is a principle. And from that place, we can truly distinguish what is useful information and what is not. Thank you. Thank you.